This is Cole Bear and Brent Bear, and we are interviewing James Stilwell, who served in the Marines during 1966 to 1970 as part of the Veterans History Project for Hans Holdman's Eagle Project. So, uh, uh, but still, um, where did you go to boot camp? MCRD, San Diego. Marine recruit depot. Okay. Were there any ways that you got past that? Were there any things that uh, helped you get past boot camp? Yeah, we just did what they told us to do in our training and stuff. And yeah. Basic stuff. So, um, after boot camp. How long did boot camp last? I think we were there eight weeks. We did it. We were pushing them through pretty quick at that time. And did they have DIs that yeah. called drill instructors? They didn't like us calling them DIs. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> why is that? Huh? Why is that? I don't know why. They just didn't like it. Call us drill instructor. Okay. So right after boot camp, you went to direct service, right? Well, we went into uh, second, what they call second ITR, which okay. is uh, infantry training. Uh, okay. Basically, we go out in the field, learn you know different types of weapons and stuff. Okay. So that was right after boot camp. Was that AIT? Is that what you said? It's called uh, second. Um, ITR, Infantry Training Regiment, is what it stands for. Was that close to where you did boot camp too, or? San, uh, that was in uh, Camp Pendleton. Oh, okay. So what was your MOS at the time? Uh, I was a tank mechanic. I don't, I don't remember offhand the number that it was designated at, but I was a tank mechanic. So, so typically, what did a tank mechanic do? Worked on the engines, worked on the, the tracks, whatever it needed to do. What, what were the tanks that you worked on? Uh, M48. Oh. Yeah, it weighed 50, let's see, I think it weighed 54 tons when it was combat loaded. Was it a diesel or a...? Yeah, it had a... Uh, it's Continental, let's see, it's been a long time, 1490 ABDSI, I think that's what they call it. Camera, it's been a long time. We're talking 40. How big were they? Six cylinder, eight cylinder? No, it's a uh, 12 cylinder or something. 12. Lots of horsepower? Yeah, that's why they call it a 1490. It had 1,490 horses. Oh my. It was a 12. I think it's 14. Wow. <laughs> Lots of yeah. And then when it went through the transmission, I mean the, the final drives, it had uh, 850 horses to the ground. Wow. Were they fast or were they? They run about 40 miles an hour. So very fast. Yeah. Could they fire on the fly too? And well, they could shoot, but they weren't accurate, you know, if you're running. Cause you know, you're talking 40 years of technology, and we didn't have the have all the advantages that they have today in that M1 Abrams tank. Yeah. So you see video of the Abrams, and they're unbelievable. They can fire on the fly, and they have right. you know, that what is it? The aiming systems that they have. Right. Yeah, they. From what I understand, those they can lock onto one target while the gunners are engaging it. The, Tank commander, he can lock on to another one, and when he gets done, they can shift so they can be picking out different targets while they're running. Did you ever get a chance to go out in those tanks or? The 48? Uh, oh, yeah. Test drive them? And yeah, used to work on them all the time, run them around. Were they, were they fun to drive? Oh, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I love driving. Run over about anything. <laughs> So would they would they bog down in sand and stuff or just? It it could. <clears throat> we were overseas. We had one that we got in the sand and he was on a, uh, 
on a kind of a grade sideways, and he slid off the, the track, and we had to put it back on. And stuff. Now they they could throw a, throw a track, you know, it was common. So you just put it back together. So when you put it back together again, would it used to be pins that would break, or no? It's sometimes they'd break, but very seldom. In fact, I can't even remember a time that the pin broke. It usually like run off of the track. It is, you know, kind of like a bicycle chain. Sure. How would it throw it? Well, it's basically the same thing. It just, you know, jump the sprocket, and then you take it apart and restrip it and put it back together. So um, when you went out uh, on the um, what were the quarters like? Words. Well, if you're talking about the barracks stateside, they're about like a hotel, only more like a dormitory. A whole bunch of guys all living in. Whereas, I mean, they were they were some pretty nice quarters. Yeah. We got aboard ship, and we we're crammed in there like sardines. <laughs> so, but, well, what do you remember about the quarters? Did you have a lot of roommates, or? Yeah, it was like a great big dormitory, you know, like a college dormitory. So two or so, three to a room, or? No, it was all one big room. One big room. Yeah, if you were the higher rank people, then they had their own their own rooms. But, but you know, the the enlisted men in the lower ranks, they just lived in like a big dormitory. So about so they had two racks. Bunk beds or like bunk beds? Like bunk beds. Oh, okay. So, about how many people would you say were in the lower class? Oh, in the dormitory? Yeah. Lower yeah. Oh, I don't know. I think maybe probably probably a probably hundred in the room anyway. Maybe maybe a little more. So, okay. lights out at a certain time. State sides at ten. Ten o'clock. Ten oh. o'clock. All oh, the lights went out at ten. And then Reveille in the morning, or yeah, what time? Uh, let's see, I think it was about five. Then. <laughs> so, did you ever get enough sleep in the military? Yeah, yeah, really, yeah, I did. This, you know, it depended upon what you were doing. If you're just a normal work day and stuff, yeah, I got plenty of sleep. If, you know, if you're on the guard or something like that, where they had, and where you're doing something, sometimes you didn't get get much sleep. But. So, typical day for a tank mechanic would start what time in the morning? And well, they normally had uh, had muster about I think it was about seven in the morning, and then when they got through, you know, saying whatever they needed to say for that day, then they dismiss us and we go to work and we usually get started about, about 8 in the morning. We get started working and, and then they'd have a noon muster and then they'd have a, an evening muster and then that was, that was usually around 4 o'clock and then we'd go do whatever we wanted. So how many people would work with you as you were repairing tanks and stuff? Would you have large groups of guys or? Uh, depending upon what it was, what you were doing, you know, sometimes one guy would go out and work on it, sometimes you'd have to have many guys, sometimes you'd have to take a, you know, recovery vehicle to, to get a recovery vehicle. Let me think, we had uh, one, two, three, four, I believe there was four of us on the recovery vehicle. We'd go out and pull them back in, fix them up. So, of course, when you'd go out to get these, you'd probably be armed, right? Well, when I was overseas, I, I didn't work on them. That was on the state side. I was on a recovery vehicle. But when I went overseas, I was I rode on the tank itself when I went out. Mm -hmm. with them. So you'd have troops attached to that tank, and they would ride right on the tank? Well, the infantry guys, they had to walk, or we'd give them a ride, depending upon, you know, what the circumstances of it, but I always rode I, I never did do any walking. I didn't like to walk. I was, I was glad to be on the tank. <laughs> How much gas mileage did a tank get? How many miles to the gallon? Do you remember? 
Uh, it seems to me like they figure they remembered uh, one gallon to the mile. Wow. And from what I understand, the Abrams takes more gallons than that now to run it. So, so they, they didn't figure how many miles to the gallon. It was how many gallons to the mile. How many gallons to the mile. <laughs> So typically a tank would have a big gun and then would it have other smaller guns? Yeah, uh, our tank had a 90 millimeter gun tube and then it had a coaxially mounted... Uh, Which isn't that caliber. big, that's, that's not huge. 90 millimeter? Or caliber or whatever, I don't remember other day, it was a 90. 90. They call it a 90 and now they're up to, I think it's a 120 on the... On the Abrams now, I believe is what it is. Okay. Well, they, it was about that big round, really. And then they, there. <laughs> and they have a coaxially mounted 30 caliber machine gun. And then uh, we had a 50 on top, sky mounted. And that was the main armaments on the tank. And then everything else we could get our hands on. The, um, uh, the crew, they carried. 45s, you know, for the personal weapon. I carry, I carried an M16, and then we had what they call a three-round looper, which was an M79 grenade launcher, and it it held three three rounds in it. It was kind of like a clip, and then uh, and uh, we also had an M14 that we carried on the on the tank too. We, if we could get our hands on something, we carried it. So the M16, is that a 9mm? No. Uh, the M16, that's a, that's a shoulder rifle. That's right. an infantry. It's a, uh, two, a point, let's see, what is it? 223? 223. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's a 223. It's the M16. And uh, the M14 with a 7.62 NATO round, they call it. And we had our grenade launcher, and then and also we had a, um, we call it a grease gun. It was a 45, kind of like a submachine gun. Sit there and look at it, it looks like a grease gun, that's why they call it that. Almost yeah. round too, yeah. Yeah, that's what it looked Take like. The clip out the side maybe? Come down the bottom. The bottom. And then it had a wire shoulder stock on it that you, you pulled out. Just so did you carry extra barrels on those 50 and 30 cal machine guns? Yeah. Because you melt those down pretty quick, I guess, if you're yeah, firing full auto. Yeah, one night on the 50, we were working with it, and we were pouring oil and stuff on it to try to keep it cool down. <laughs> Got kind of hot. Now, they're not cooled at all. You're just trying to cool them off mm -hmm. surface temperature. Yeah. Did you ever see them start glowing? When you fired him? Yeah, first. My first firefight. That was the one where. That was the worst one for me. Tell me and about it, that. Yeah, we were just uh, out on Hill 190. We were just set up and they sent out. Every night they'd send out a patrol for an ambush. And what I understand is they had. Uh, uh, they had some. Uh, information that the Viet Cong was going to come in and raid the village that was there by us and steal the rice and stuff. And so they sent out an ambush to, you know, try to catch them. And anyway, when they come in, they started a firefight and started doing a lot of shooting. So would they have automatic weapons too that they were shooting at you with? Or yeah, AK-47s. AK-47s. And what, what typically would you wear to protect yourself? Would you wear any flak jacket or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, we have flak jackets. The infantry wore them. Of course, uh, in our tank gets 54, 54 tons of flak jacket. So. 54 tons. <laughs> it's always nice to be behind one of those. Yeah. So did they, have, did they have pretty good luck keeping any of their artillery out of the tanks, or did you ever have trouble with the tanks getting penetrated by rounds or anything like that? Uh, we, we never did. No. We never had any problems at all with, 
with it. You know, they never had any, but, you know, we never went up against anything big enough to hurt us. You know, some of the other people I've heard you know, got some RPGs. That's, that's what we feared the most was an RPG, because they didn't go right through it. Asking all the questions, sorry. So, um, on the on the ships, uh, what kind of entertainment did you have? Well, depend upon which ship we were on. On uh, we were on the Cleveland and the Duluth. We'd go out on the flight deck of a night, you know, and they'd show movies from time to time. Oh, and we'd okay. watch watch different movies. When we were on, when I was on the the Iwo Jima. They had closed circuit TV, and so we'd just watch cable TV, t cable TV on board ship. They'd uh, they'd show movies there. Would they have television in the mess hall, or how would they do that? Uh, I've never seen a t TV in the mess hall. We we had it right there in our in our compartment where we oh. slept. So everybody would have a television. Yeah. Okay. So you know, a bunch of us all in you know in together, but there was TV just. Later here all day, watch TV as long as they were showing a program. Were there any uh, spats between the people in the quarters? <laughs> all the time. <laughs> there was all the time somebody fighting. Yeah. Throw a few punches and it'd be over with. <laughs> well, it was close quarters and yeah, it was real. You, know, you can't move without stepping on somebody on the Cleveland and Duluth. The, the the Iwo Jima was it was quite a bit bigger. We had quite a bit more room, but it was still kind of kind of crowded. And I'm kind of claustrophobic anyway. I don't like crowds and confinement. So, how much time did you spend on a ship? Oh, I spent time on there. You know, different times. One time I was out there. I think. Oh, about a week or two, and then we made made an amphibious landing, and we were, you know, operating there for several weeks, and then we went back aboard ship, and then I was on it for several weeks before we did anything else, before we come off of it. So how would you get from the ship to the shore? On a mic mic boats, what, what? or on a helicopter, depending upon what they were having us do. What would the mic mic boats do? Okay, Mike Mike boats held the tanks, and they were a landing craft, and so we'd get on the tank and then sink the back of the of the Duluth or the Cleveland. The back of it opened up, it go out into the water, and then uh, we'd circle around, and then they'd send us in on waves when we made our amphibious assault on Barrier Island. The infantry guys, they went in on the first wave, and then we went in on the second wave. How many tanks could you get on those boats? One. One at a time? Yeah, we had, uh, so we had four Mike Mike boats. And so we had four tanks in it, and we had another tank that they come back and get. And so did you ever have any experiences where your tank broke down in some pretty bad places? <laughs> oh. I don't know if it's, I wouldn't call it bad places, nothing where, you know, where we were in any danger when they did, but, uh, or at least not when, when I was with them. But uh, here on Barrier Island, we was doing some operations, they come back in and we started shutting down and we were checking it out, you know, doing the cool down process of the motor and stuff and we opened it up and we were on fire. And we were sitting next to the ammo dump. <laughs> we kept trying to put the fire out, and we finally had to bring in the CBs with a dozer and bury the tank to smother the fire. We're not talking a little fire, we're talking a big fire then. Wow. Yeah, we, just, we just didn't have nothing to put it out. They brought a dozer in and literally buried the tank. Yeah, to smother the fire. And then unburied it, of course. And then you yeah. get to play with it to clean it up. Yeah. And and we took it into Da Nang there at FSR, pulled the engine transmission and completely rebuilt, completely rebuilt it and then put it, put it back in there. 
So how long would something like that take you to do? Uh, I thought I think we were in there pretty close to two weeks before they had it had her back together where we ready to go operational again. So would you guys do all the machine work on it too, or just no, give, the, give parts? No, the, um, we just did the the field stuff on it. Okay. When we took it into FSR, they had a regular shop and stuff for me. I mean, they could they could rebuild it right there. They had all their all the tools and equipment that they needed to strip it all the way down and then rebuild it. So it takes probably some specialized training. What kind of specialized training did you get while you were in the military for the mechanics? Mechanics tearing down the motors and stuff. Any any special schools or anything that you had to go to or? Yeah, yeah, we spent. Uh, I think about nine weeks at Del Mar, which is there by San Diego, but that's that was their school for for uh, armor, teaching them the the tank was, uh, the tank mechanics and, and the auto skies and that's, that was their mechanic school. That's that's pretty intense, probably training. Oh, they they had one 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 funny thing about it when we were there, they had. Uh, Oh, they had a day where they brought school kids in, and we had all the tanks lined up, aimed at the there at the where they had all the classes. It was I think that thing was a two-story building there where they were having all the classes. They had all the tank different tanks and the um, the flamethrower tanks and the autos and the different different equipment lined up there so they could show all the school kids and stuff and they were letting them crawl all over the the tanks and the equipment and all this some little kid got up in there and he started flipping switches on the on the flame tank. He set it off. <laughs> he got a big old puff of smoke coming out the barrel. <laughs> Didn't hurt anybody, no, just scared no, it, of some people. No, it, it was empty. It was just what was left over. It just made a big old poof of smoke come out of it and it's about screwed that kid half to death. And, and that sergeant out there, he about died. <laughs> he said he was up in there quick shutting things down. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it was just fun. It was fun. One of the one of the Marines family probably. Huh? One of the kids. School school kids oh, from school in town. Kids. Yeah, okay. And then they uh they had a, like a little tour that they were showing them, they were all in it. They they're little kids, not very not very old. And, he was up in there playing, he started flipping the switches, and I, I guess he finally hit the right one at the right time, and he set it off. <laughs> did you have to Did you have to sight the guns in? Was that part of your duties, too? Or? No, I, I didn't do that. That was, uh, oh, well, the, the crew guys were the ones that did the bore sighting and stuff on it. They had their optics and stuff. I, I never mess with any of the optics part of it. I was just the mechanical part, you know, the engines, transmission, the tracks, road wheels, that kind of stuff. But, uh, the optics and the radios, they, they had other people who did that. So how much water could you get in with a tank before it had affected? Well, <laughs> when we made our amphibious landing on Barrier Island, we had... Uh, we hit a sandbar. We wasn't able to get all the way up on the beach, and the, the coxswain hit back off, and he'd get another run at it. And hit the sandbar, and finally our tank commander said, "Just drop the, just drop the, the ramp." And he said, "We'll just drive up on there." Anyway, we pulled off on it. He said, "The, the um, water was halfway up the turret." On it, and <laughs> we kept on moving. They, actually, a tank if you set it up right, you know, you got to put you know special equipment on it. It'll actually run underwater. You can submerge the whole thing, really? and it'll still run as long as you can get air. As long as you can get air to the to the engine and uh, get the exhaust out, so it doesn't run back down into it. So it'll run underwater. But it didn't stop that one. 
No, it didn't stop us a bit about drowning our driver, though. <laughs> he, his hatch wouldn't close all the way, and it had a little little gap in it, and so while we were underwater, it was all pouring in on him. So your turret would sit up here, your driver would sit in front of the turret? Is that how yeah, that worked? Yeah, like the turret would be here, and, and he'd be sitting so he, down here. So the water was halfway up the turret? Up the turret. He, he's he was completely <laughs> underwater. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Sergeant Holland told him, he said, when I tell you to step on it, he says, don't come off the throttle till I tell you. And he was... <laughs> yeah, but he, we got up on the beach and he, he stopped and he come up. He was, he, was, he, was, he was choking pretty good. So how did you empty the water out of his compartment? There's, there's an escape hatch on the bottom. You open it up and oh, it just... The water comes out. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Was the water cold? Huh? Was it cold? I don't know. I never touched it. I was, in the, I was sitting on the tank. I was watching it come up. And, and you were laughing, weren't you? Yeah. No, not really. I was I was pretty scared. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had, just before we went in, the, we had a naval ship off to the side, and I just happened to be looking at it at the time, and the whole deck just blew up. Oh, wow. And I said, oh, my, they got our got one of our ships, and then a few seconds later I watched the whole beach blow up. And what it was, was that ship launched a bunch of rockets all at once, and so it looked like the deck blew up. But it, they were launching all those rockets, and I just... And what happened when the beach huh? blew up like that? Yeah, smoke and stuff all everywhere. Oh. It just pounded it real good, real quick, and then and that's when we all started going in. So, they're clearing the beach for you. Yeah, yeah. That's it was it was more scary than than dangerous. <laughs> Did you ever go out at night on um, any night patrols or anything? No, we always hunkered down with that tank. There was, there was only one time that the tanks moved in the night. What happened there? We had a guy. He was uh, he got sick. And they had to take, get him into the hospital, so they took him back into the main base so they could get him getting some medical trip. You mentioned yeah. about a rap patrol earlier? Oh, not rap. Oh, you're talking about out there by Marble Mountain, that, mm -hmm. yep. that uh, dirt highway they had. Yeah, they, our uh, commander, he kind of got the idea to run a rap patrol of the night, so he took the trucks out there and took one of them, loaded them up with some Marines, and the idea was that they'd run up and down that road and they'd catch, catch them as they were coming across the road. And first pass out, they blew up their truck. <laughs> so then they sent out a tank, the crew. That was when uh, Company Gunny and Top, they took the tank out with the crew and went and got them, drug the tank back and picked up the guys. The next night they did it again. And they blew up the truck again. <laughs> He says, come on, Top, let's go get him. He said, I ain't going tonight. He says, well, you went last night. And he said, I was drunk last night. He said, I ain't going tonight. <laughs> he said, that's your job. He said, you go get him. He said, if you get in trouble, he said, I'll come get you because he said, they're waiting for you tonight. <laughs> but they went out and got him and picked him up. And anyway, all them guys were drunk too, so they just loaded him up and brought him back. <laughs> they, th they thought they thought they had a bunch of them got killed and stuff. And when they started picking up, picking them up, they found out the guys were just drunk. They <laughs> said, "What are you guys getting drunk for?" And they said, "Well, we knew we were going to die tonight, so we didn't want to feel a little pain, so we just got drunk." But nobody got hurt though. Lost the truck, but that was the last rap patrol. <laughs> So were there any major conflicts that you were in while you were in the military? No, no no real major battles like, you know, what you would talk, you know, they're just firefights, just, you know, you might go, you know, a week, two weeks, you know, just bored, silly, and then all of a sudden, you know, have a firefight and it just lasts a few minutes and it'd be over. and then. 
most of most of it just you know boredom. So. Did you ever capture any enemy prisoners? Yeah, we got uh, there on Barrier Island. We got one. He, uh, he was laying in some cactus, and we pulled up alongside of him and got him. And we uh, interrogated him. But he was he was a uh, you know, he was an um, an NBA scout, and, uh, according to his papers and stuff was, that we had, I mean that we found, he he was a squad leader, and he was a scout out there, and, and he found everything he had except the except his weapons, found his uniforms, his war souvenirs, his diary, and you know all that kind of stuff. Just, the only thing we couldn't find was his was his weapon. Do you remember what kind of war souvenirs he had? Yeah, he. Uh, he had some uh, U.S. watches, he had some of that, mm -hmm. some, you know, articles that he had picked up from different people. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually he, he had more money on him than than uh, all of us on the, the crew had. Really? Yeah. So we kind of divided it up as little souvenirs. I got I got some of it at the house. Huh. Yeah. Or had, had it, the kids got into it when they were little and scattered around, so I don't know where it's all at, but, but I brought some of it home. He was, he was, he was pretty good, you know, I, I liked that guy. He was, they were interrogating him and he first said he was a, he was a peasant. And they asked him where he got his hair cut and he said, well, the barber cut me before they left. And, I said, well, why'd they leave you behind? And he said, well, they didn't like me, so they just left me when they, when the villagers moved out. And, and Did he explain why they left him? They didn't like him. That's what he said. Uh, uh, he was making up stories to try to get away, let us, of course, to let him go. But, you know, Holland been there. Sergeant Holland, he'd been there. I think this was his third tour of duty, and he was the one that was doing the interrogating. He, he caught him in every lie he made. So. Yeah, he was pretty scared. So how would you talk to him? Because did they have an interpreter there? Yeah, or? yeah we had an interpreter. Was it a, uh, a local that would help? No, we had a Marine that he, he spoke Vietnamese. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he spoke Vietnamese and he could read read Vietnamese. And he was reading the, reading his diary and his papers. And uh, he had talked to him. Where did he learn Vietnamese, do you know? Oh, I don't know. I imagine he went to a school. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so, you know, some some people have an act with uh, with language and stuff. And, sure. You know, like uh, some people have an act with communication, so they can put them in radio and stuff. And then some people, you know, they have an act for mechanics, and so they put them in the mechanics. It's, that's that's really Okay. So, what do you remember? What was the highlight of your military career? What's the thing you remember the most? Oh, I remember the most. Mm, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there is any one particular thing that stands out more than anything else. It's, it's, anything you're particularly proud of or mm, memories that you cherish? Mm, all of it, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's. I had a person one time tell me, he said, you need to forgive yourself for what, you know, because we, we killed some people over there, you know, hurt, you know, hurt a lot of people and stuff, but, but you need to forgive yourself. And I thought about it and I said, well, if I had it to do over again, would I do it again? And I said, is there anything about it, if I could change it, is there anything I'd change? I said, yeah, there's a lot of things that I would change. But if I had it to do over again, and, it would, and I knew it would be exactly the same, would I do it again? And my reasons for doing what I did, I said, yeah, I'd do it again. And it's not, you know, it's nothing that I'm ashamed of. I just, it's 
something I just prefer not to, not to talk about. But sure. But, uh, you still keep in touch with some of your buddies that you had? No, not really. I uh, haven't uh, talked to any of them since, since we left there. It's, you know, uh, I got, got some cousins that, that were over there and stuff that, uh, you know, I knew talk to them from time to time, but, you know, they're, they're relatives and stuff, but as far as people that I served with that, that overseas, that, uh, you know, we kind of went our separate ways when we, when we come back, got out. What was it like when you got out of the military? Did you, did you have a good experience coming home? What, when I come back from overseas? Yeah. Uh, about like a plane ride coming home and going, uh, just went home and took a while to kind of calm down, relax and stuff. Just, yeah. the, the, uh, the stories that I've heard sometimes is that the, the vets didn't get really good receptions when they came home. Yeah, Did you see any of that? Or? Yeah, that's, that's true. And, my last duty station was with uh, the I and I staff. There with uh, there in we're stationed there at uh, Miramar Naval Air Station. I was with a reserve unit, and part of the duties that I was assigned is I had to take the officer around to the college campuses. They were doing a program with NBC. I think it was called. A, if I remember right, I think the name was the first Tuesday. They put it on once once a month. It was kind of like a, the CBS's 60 minute type program and, and anyway we'd go out to the, the college and they'd see that crack on the in the sidewalk, sidewalk there. He says well that side's the campus, this side is not. He says you don't cross the line onto the campus. We're not allowed to set foot on the campus and, and, uh, and they'd have their some of them college kids that have their, their little protest rallies and stuff and yelling and screaming and that kind of stuff. So they wouldn't allow you to go on the campus? Yeah, I wouldn't allow to set foot on the campus. Wow. They had to they just stand there and yell and scream and holler at us and we were just supposed to sit there and listen to it. Um, that can't be fun. Huh? I say that can't be fun. Oh, I'd, I'd have rather shot them than I would the Vietnamese. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. <laughs> what? I, didn't, I don't know what else to say. It's, you know. So when you when you got home and went home to your family, what was that like? They're obviously glad to see you. Yeah, that's. Uh, we just really we didn't talk too much about anything. I was mom needed her mom needed her fence painted, or and so uh, I just went out there and painted her painted the fence. And you'd be surprised just how relaxing that was to sit there and paint that fence. And so yeah, didn't talk too much. <laughs> I had to relax. <laughs> that is probably nice after mm -hmm. being where you've been. What was the weather like when you were overseas? And on, like for example, the the uh, at the hills, like Hill Fifty Five, and it was hot. Was it hot? Hot and humid. Yeah, just was it during the summertime you were there? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I, went, I watched the rice fields. When I was on uh, Hill 190, the rice fields were all green. Prettiest green you ever want to see. It was beautiful. To sit up there and look at, you know, as far as you could see, all the rice paddies and stuff. I mean, just a beautiful green. And then uh, while we were there, it, it all ripened and turned to a real pretty golden color. And then they, they were out there harvesting the, the rice and stuff. And uh, we were kind of patrolling the road one day and we had this little kid and he was 
had one of those yokes and had a couple of baskets of, of rice on her. He was screaming. He was just kind of trotting right along the side of us. And said, you know, that's a pretty big load for that little kid. It says, we'll carry it for us. So we tried to pick it up. We couldn't. <laughs> really? Yeah. It was heavy. And we, could, we couldn't get it up and balance it where we could where we could walk with it. We had to give it back to him. And, <laughs> that's what we and, did. Yeah, a little bitty guy. Kid. I mean, he was, wasn't very old. He was, but he was keeping right pace with us. They said later on that it was a lot of laws of physics go into the go into carrying that and that yoke they have is it's like a spring, and so every time they take a, a step, the ends of it would would bend and then they'd come back up, and then the the length of the bass the the ropes you see them because they hang down there by the ground, well that's a certain length, so that all that weight is right there at the at the ground, and so he gets a, gets that spring bouncing up and down. So when it comes up, he's got very little weight on his shoulder, and then he makes a step, and then and they say that's why he could carry it. And we couldn't because we got a way up high, and he was moving it while it was up in the air. Yeah. And we, you know, it wasn't wasn't set up for us, so we couldn't get the spring and stuff for working right. How much do you think that weighed? Well, oh, oh, I bet it weighed. 150, maybe maybe more. Wow. There was a lot of weight on that. <laughs> I think we were surprised him carrying that. We had we had to have guys help pick it up, uh, get it up. And he said, <laughs> "Give it back to me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, did you did you spend a lot of time look seeing the villages and what they looked like and how people lived over there? Uh the only time that I actually went into a village is when we were on a sweep, and people were, they were real scared of us when we went in there. Of course, you know, we didn't go in there, you know, being nice, we were, we were looking for things and stuff. But uh, now, the villages, you know, that I seen was, you know, from a, from a distance, uh, like Hill 190, we had the people from the village. Those, those people there at that village, they 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 liked us, and they had uh, they'd come up and they'd do our laundry and stuff. We'd give them our stuff. They'd take it down the river and wash it and bring it back, and they'd make make sandals and stuff for us. And we liked those people. We were they were pretty nice. So, so you got a chance to visit with people and talk to people a little bit. Uh, just interact a little bit. I mean. It's, not any real social thing like that. Sure. You know, the CAC, the CAC units. Those guys, they they actually lived in the village with the people, but but we didn't. So, so when you were over there, you stayed in barracks. No. No. Not, not in Vietnam. When we were out there, we the infantry guys, the grunts, they they lived right on the ground. Really. And we lived on the tank itself. So when it would rain and stuff like that, it would be. It, 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 it never rain. it never rained a drop when I was over there. Really? Not while I was there. It didn't rain a, didn't rain a drop. We only had one uh, one evening that we got kind of a heavy mist, but it it never did rain while I was there. Really? So, Just nice and hot. Hot all the time. It's hot. So what kind of temperatures were we talking? Hundred mm, anyway. Hundred. So pretty similar to here in Illinois. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> what did you do for fun while you were over there? Entertainment. Well, if you were in Da Nang at the base, they had, they had uh, clubs that, that you'd go to at night, and they'd about you know they'd have, uh, have shows and that kind of stuff that they put on. A lot of drinking. But, but when you went out in the bush, you didn't have didn't have no no. No entertainment at all. Nothing you, yeah, you were pretty well paying attention to what was going on. So what would you eat when you were out in the bush like that? Well, they had uh, sea rations. They had, uh, had like regular regular meals. Just come in a can and a bag. But, uh, most of the guys would uh, fight over the, the fruits. You know, like canned peaches and pears and Fruit cocktail, that that kind of stuff. That that was a premium. That's what everybody wanted. 
and then the rest of the stuff was kind of, oh well. And if you got spaghetti, yeah, I'll throw it away. <laughs> but, uh, no, we, we, uh, when, one time we tried to trade some seed rations for some rice from from the local bill. There was people that lived there, and they, but they wouldn't trade with us. They wouldn't. They wouldn't do that. And so try to say, you know, this is actually better than rice, but we'd rather have the rice because we eat this stuff all the time. And, but they they would they wouldn't trade. It's, so I don't know if they were, you know, afraid to trade or. You know, with us, or whether they're afraid of the Viet Cong, those people were retaliating against them. So, but they wouldn't do it anyway. Well, we are actually coming up on time. Do you have anything else you want to ask? Um. Still well? One last thing. Um. Were there any uh, captures that um just kind of amazed you, like um? On um, movies, they say um, uh, it's so scary it'll make your skin crawl. Oh yeah, that was that was the guy we caught there in the cactus. His his arm, his the flesh on his arm would would just ripple like that when we when we first got him, and then uh, pull his bat pull his pants down and his butt and just. So he just quiver and stuff. He was he, he was scared, and uh, we tried to get him to lay down, you know, because at first we you know we were scared that he had explosives and stuff, and so we were watching him and uh, try to get him down so we could kind of search him a little bit, but he absolutely refused to lay down. He would not lay down under because he I guess he figured we were going to run over him with the tank because we had him right by, so he but he wouldn't lay down, but. As soon as he realized that uh, we wasn't going to hurt him, he, he settled right down. Mm -hmm. And we began interrogating him and that kind of stuff. It was, you know, he was scared, we were scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing some information with us tonight. Yeah. Uh -huh. We appreciate that.